things people will say, oh, do we need masks? Do we need to clean the air? Do we need to scrub the surfaces? Do we still need to wash our hands? And the answer is yes. With Delta especially, we have to have what has been referred to, this is a, a picture that was adapted by Ian McKay um, called the Swiss cheese model. Each layer has its own little, it's not perfect, right? But when you stack it together, you get a block. And that is what we need to protect us um, from Delta, especially in schools. And so today you'll hear from various people about all the different measures um, that are being used and, all, and why all of these matter and how you will know how to implement them. And so at this point, um, I would like to hand it off to uh, Dr. Denise um, DeWald, who is gonna tell us a little bit more about concerns or things we should be thinking about the status of schools right now. She'll give a little bit of a background and help me finish off this introduction. Denise. Thank you, Kim. Um, so I am a pediatrician and I am here to advocate on behalf of all the children who may need medical care in the next few months. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the capacity of the pediatric hospital system, because we've gotten a lot of reassurances, most children don't get sick, but we're now seeing children getting sick. And so we're back to talking about flattening the curve. So Delta is different. Delta is sickening children, and it is also as contagious as chicken pox. Um, and the problem is, is that the pediatric hospital system isn't able to absorb a surge as well as the adult system because there are far fewer pediatric beds and pediatric hospitals provide specialized, very specialized care to children that adult hospitals can't provide for. And so there, as of 2018, there were 27,500 inpatient pediatric beds and 5,400 pediatric ICU or PICU beds. Um, and usually pediatric hospitals are about 80% full um, with a little bit of routine surge capacity um, for, for taking care of like RSV and flu. But 80% of these beds are taken up by children with cancer, asthma, diabetes, sickle cell disease, among many others. So all treatable conditions that are potentially life-threatening. So our wiggle room for taking care of children with COVID is really only about 5,500 hospitalized children and 1,100 children in the ICU um, before we start impacting the care of all of these medically vulnerable children that we need to take care of. And so like pediatric cancer patients, 80% of pediatric cancer patients are cured or become long-term survivors. And treatment interruptions can really harm their prognosis. So they be become untreatable and die from an otherwise treatable cancer. And they're also very susceptible to getting sick with COVID and dying from COVID. So we need to protect them. Um, so what? So let's look at the numbers. We've got about 34 million school children in the US who are susceptible to COVID. And based on the numbers from last year, we could expect about a 1% of them to need to be hospitalized if they're unvaccinated and catch COVID. And about one third of those children um, would need pediatric ICU care. And so with Delta being as contagious as chickenpox, if because of inadequate mitigation, we end up with a scenario where like 50% of school children get infected over the span of 30 days, and 1% are hospitalized and they stay in the hospital for 2.5 days, we would need 14,000 pediatric hospital beds and 4,700 PICU beds. But we just said our wiggle room is 5,500 5,500 um, inpatient pediatric beds and 1,100 PICU beds. So we will overwhelm the capacity of the system to take care of the sick children. And if we are off by just a little bit, many more children, if many more children are hospitalized or they stay longer, there will be many, many children who we go without medical care. And how do you triage children in a crisis situation? Most of the children who enter a pediatric hospital can be expected to live long and full lives. And so the children are counting on us to get this right. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, that sets the stage for the background, and I thank you for that. I will now talk about what we know about how this virus is transmitted. Uh, I will just say that I've spent a lot of time, as well as many others, about just basically saying since the beginning that this virus is spread in tiny little aerosols, and so now I want to bring everybody up to speed about what we know about the airborne transmission of this virus. 
So this is a figure that uh, Lindsay Marr actually, who speaks after me, um, her child it made. Um, and so we've been, it's gotten lots of use, but it lays out very well um, sort of the situation that we're dealing with and how this virus is, is spread. And the main way it's spread is by in tiny little aerosols. So when you basically, you don't have to cough, you don't have to sneeze. And, and many people that are spreading this disease don't have any symptoms. So they're, they don't even know they're sick. So they're out you know, talking, yelling, singing. Um, and when you do that, you produce thousands of aerosols, not very many of these big droplets. And these aerosols behave much like cigarette smoke. They just will float in the room and they can fill a room. You know, think about being in the room with a cigarette sm smoker and over time, how it can build up over time if you don't have good enough ventilation. This is why ventilation is so important. This is why indoors is the air place where most of the spread happens. So basically aerosols come out, also a few little droplets, but the difference is, is that the, the aerosols float and the droplets drop. And so that's where the six feet, this magical six feet came in, was that people were really fixated in the medical community mostly on droplets, but that's not what is driving this disease. And so basically still at close range, we, distance still matters because aerosols are still really close, uh, concentrated up close. So short range inhalation is most likely the dominant pathway. Droplets, they will only get you if they you know, splatter right on your nose or your mouth or your eyes. And there, again, there aren't very many. And then as over time, you can see that there's this, what we call long range aerosol inhalation, which is in medical terms has always been called quote airborne, but it doesn't, distance doesn't matter. There's papers written about this. All evidence that we have right now points to aerosol transmission. We don't have any evidence for, for droplets. And we have, you know, there's sort of studies coming out about surfaces. You know, it's still really important to clean surfaces, but not spend so much time and so much money. We really, one key thing to school reopening is rather than worrying about, you know, we got to clean where the virus is, and that is the air. And today we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that. What makes this extra challenging has already been mentioned. It's nearly as contagious as chickenpox. People kept saying, ah, it's not airborne because it's not that contagious. Well, guess what? Delta is. And there's a thousand times the viral load. So you heard of this 15 minute recommendation by CDC. If you believe that that's kind of the limit of how much you should be, because longer you're with somebody in a room, the more chance you'll, you'll inhale it and get infected. If you believe the 15 minute magical number. Um, now, if you take a thousand times the viral load, then in, in basically in one second, you could inhale that same amount of virus. So it's gone from 15 minutes down to one second that you're exposed to the same amount of virus. Okay, so the, key, the reason we've been pushing so hard and the reason schools need to acknowledge is that once, it's, once we acknowledge it's airborne, the good news is it's fixable. We can clean the air. There, we've been using technologies to clean the air for decades. It's very, very possible. And we can sort of slow down all the effort we put into clean, you know, cleaning, scrubbing. Don't spray chemicals in the air. That just makes worse air. And we can start you know, thinking about other, you know, basically looking at it um, from the perspective of the air. So CDC is now on board, says the chance of being infected is very, very low from surfaces. It's, again, it's still possible. Uh, there's very strong statements that came out finally in about April that we really need to be focusing on airborne transmission. So the last little bit that I wanna point out is once again, once we understand how it's transmitted, it's essential, then we can, we can actually figure out where are the riskiest places? What are the riskiest activities that are leading to the spread? So the bottom line, as I've already said, is indoors is far, high, far higher risk than outdoors. Um, and so that's just because of dilution. You know, outdoors, it just gets diluted. So you can't inhale as much as quickly. Um, not wearing masks indoors, it's not a good idea, especially with Delta. And you'll hear from Lindsay Marr after this, you know, what kind of masks should we be thinking about? You also, if you really have to be indoors without masks, I'm thinking lunch, um, you know, you really want, you really don't want to be talking because just talking produces more, yelling even more, singing even more, exerting yourself in sports even more. So we really have to be thinking about these things. The other thing is, Sometimes we're so fixated on the classroom that we forget there's other places that we could get a, kids could get infected like cars and buses, smaller confined spaces, elevators, bathrooms. A big missing thing, if you learn nothing but this today, is that 
the person that's infectious doesn't have to be in the room at the same time as you. They could have been there before you because this, once it's in aerosols, it can exist in the air for hours. And so there is evidence that people have like walked into a bathroom, which is notoriously poorly, which are notoriously poorly ventilated and they become infected. So we really need to just become more aware and you'll hear more about eating lunch, but basically this just shows risk. What's the safest things to do? Be quiet and wear face coverings all the way down to the, the riskiest is in a bar, people yelling with no masks. And so again, we can think about things in a much more sensible way and protect ourselves if we understand how we're catching it. So the last thing I want to point out is just this one key point, because today we're going to talk a lot about masks and whether there should be universal masks, whether everybody should be wearing masks, even the vaccinated. This just shows how much virus is in someone that's infected um, it, for somebody who's had a breakthrough. So they're doubly vac fully vaccinated and they catch it versus somebody that's unvaccinated and gets infected. And you can see the viral load is as high for the vaccinated person, but for a shorter time period, but still as high. So this is why I think you'll hear a lot of us saying that it's really important for many reasons that everybody right now to get us through Delta and to stop this thing, we should all be wearing masks. Mm -hmm.